Okay, we should be recording. Awesome. So just to begin, um, I, I'm not as familiar, I think, as I should be of the history of socialism in Madagascar. Uh, the most I know is uh, the figure of, of Didier uh, Ratsaraka, I believe, the Red Admiral. Yes. Uh, so if, if you don't mind giving, I guess, like a brief introduction about the history, and then we can talk more about what it looks like today and what the, the post-socialist period has looked like in Madagascar. Sure. So uh, a quick history. Uh, when Madagascar became independent, uh, the first president, Serenan, was seen as being very close to France. And there are many that felt that uh, it wasn't a true independence because of the ongoing relationship with France, even in a post-colonial era. So, so we saw it was a long story, but 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 the first president pushed out of office, let's say in 1972, um, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and for many that is seen as the revolution. Uh, and uh, when he when when Sivanan was pushed out of office, as it was truly severing with France in a different way, uh, there was then this period of two and a half, almost three years of uh, of military leadership. Uh, where uh, there were, well, three different leaders, if you include someone for an extremely short period of time. Um, and, uh, and ultimately that led to the military directorate uh, nominating Didi Rasirak to, uh, to be the leader who was then, as you say, a, a rear admiral. Um, uh, he, uh, so, so he came into power uh, and very quickly had a plan, right? And his plan was, well, first to, to not be a military ruler, right? To doff his military uh, uh, garb. Uh, and instead it was sort of van vogue at the time uh, to follow a specific form of socialism uh, that was popular in Tanzania, for instance, at the time, and it was sort of a modified version of, of Soviet style socialism. Right. Uh, and so, so he created, and this is in 1975 uh, at this point. Uh, so he created a red book uh, that followed that uh, and substantially changed the economy uh, with a series of acts to, to nationalize certain industries uh, while uh, pouring that money into state-led development. And that was the kind of the scientific part of scientific socialism is that it has this sort of developmentalist end. Mm -hmm. uh, he was not accused of um, corruption in the sense of enriching himself or, you know, uh, he, he was not like Mobutu Sesseko in Zaire at the time, right? Who was, uh, who was uh, busy trying to get rich or something, right? That was not, that was not uh, his objective. Uh, he seemed to truly believe in what he was doing. Uh, he was in a dialogue. He liked power. He didn't like sharing it, uh, but um, uh, but uh, but he truly seemed to believe in in the economic principles of scientific socialism in the way that it was designed. Uh, and it didn't go the way he planned. Um, uh, it you know the the nationalization. Uh, it, let me back up to say that that Madagascar's economic ties internationally were very strong. It was a very big part of GDP, um, uh, larger of GNP, obviously. Um, and uh, and so, so the idea that you would nationalize private industry with all these European com companies uh, mm -hmm. has a very negative economic effect, right? And we saw capital flight. Uh, and so from the period of 1977 to 1979, with an intensification at the end of that period in 79, uh, we, saw, we saw capital flight because uh, you know, foreign industries don't like to be nationalized. <laughs> so um, it was during that same period that we saw the, the, the investment into state-led industries uh, that again, kind of looked like Tanzania did during uh, during your area, if you've uh, read about that period at all, um, where it was like, okay, well, let's we want an industrial sector growth. We don't want to just be a farming country. We want industrial sector growth. It's up to the state to do that, 
um, most of those efforts led to white elephants. Uh, that is, you know, that these sort of very unproductive, uneconomically productive uh, uh, industrial bases that that died very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, there was even an, an attempt uh, at a uh, at a Malgash car, and uh, mm -hmm. that in so many in so many countries that for whatever reason that's seen as the great nationalist symbol. If you can make your own car, right? Mm -hmm. Tanzania tried that. Kenya tried that. Um, others, right? And Madagascar briefly tried that. Um, but the idea of what it takes economically to make it to have a market for the purchase of cars at that scale to make it economically feasible, right? It's it wasn't realistic. So it was a short lived, -lived period because the economic crisis started to set in in 1979 and by 1981 was catastrophic. Uh, so in 1981, uh, Ratsirak had to call the IMF, right? <laughs> and, uh, and say, save us. Uh, and so then began a two year period of negotiations with the IMF and the World Bank about a restructuring followed by a very difficult period from let's say 1983 or so until 1989, uh, where, where there was high activity from the IMF and the World Bank at the same time that Ratsirak was trying to maintain his second republic, which was based on a socialist principle. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you make a deal with the IMF, there's ramifications. Well, you can't nationalize industries. You have to allow for that international trade, right? Like these things that are not particularly socialist. So that right. period of 1983 to 1989 was sort of socialism with an asterisk in the sense that we saw a lot of privatization going on despite the name of scientific socialism. It was also during that period, 1983 was a coup attempt, okay. uh, unsuccessful coup attempt. And we saw we saw a shift in what socialism meant from something more idealistic to something that looks a whole lot like we've seen in other countries of, of how do you maintain power and right. greater autocracy, mm -hmm. right? And less idealism, more autocracy. Um, and that continued um, until the, well, the reforms in 1989 that really were abandoning the socialism aspects. Right. Um, and then in 1991 was, uh, a, a large national civil servant strike. Uh, and uh, that, that was the beginning of the end of the Second Republic. Uh, and so there were large demonstrations in the streets, you know, continuously. And what Sirak was faced with uh, that moment that autocrats kind of get of, do you allow it to happen or do you use the military and turn on your own people, right? right? And to his credit, he did not turn on his own people. He allowed it to happen. It ultimately led to the signing of what's known as the Panorama Accords of October 1991, which was a, uh, a transition period um, and ultimately new elections uh, where he was voted out of office. Mm -hmm. He was successfully voted out of office and then that's the beginning of what we say is now the democratic period starting in 1993. There's a constitutional convention, the, the constitution of the third republic. Um, and, and that was the end of scientific socialism. Mm -hmm. the, the semicolon in that is that uh, the first president was uh, removed from office. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there was an interim president. There were legitimate new elections and Latsirak was elected as a new Democrat. Right, so he comes back. Uh, he comes back. At that point, he's not a socialist and he's not an autocrat, but he is, let's say, a command economy, right? Like there were some flavors of the Second Republic, even right. if he wasn't, but he wasn't trying to sever ties with France or like, you, et cetera, like as he was in, in the 70s and 80s. Um, but, but he was certainly um, a centrist, let's say, right? And, and politically trying to centralize power in that way. Um, once again, that was not too popular. Um, he tried to, he took legal means to do some pretty shady things, okay. um, such as the president has the right to fire members of the Supreme Court, um, of the high constitutional court. And he did just before the elections, right? Or, you know, and uh, things like that. So, there, so the elections happen um, in, in 2001, um, they're contested elections. It leads to this big uh, 
social movement. Uh, and uh, the challenger was uh, Mark Ravlamanana, who was a, he was mayor of the capital for a couple of years before that. And before that, he was a captain of industry. Uh, and uh, so we see a real military conflict in the country, a balkanization of the country for about six months. Um, ultimately, Ratzirak loses that and he flees the country for France, right? Okay. And, uh, and that was uh, the end of the Ratzirak for real era, right? <laughs> but uh, so that's, that's sort of the, the time period. So, so the times when you could say this was really a socialist experiment was 1975 to about 1981. Okay. Um, and then again, there was that period where it's called socialism, but it was really just, how do I maintain power? Right? Uh -huh. Well, I'm, I'm curious about his, uh, as you called it, his, his version of the red book, uh, the charter of the Malagasy socialist revolution. What kind of theories was he laying out in there? Um, and how did it, uh, you compared it to Nire's Ujama, for example. Um, so how did it compare to other really, I think, as you said, like developmentalist focused yeah. socialist projects. So it was much closer to a Soviet style socialism than Nyerere was. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there were no, so like a central point of Ujama and even the, the Jama, right, of Ujama, right, um, is the coming together as a family into a unit, into a, right, and what that meant for, for Nerere was, was collective farming, right, and creating these collective villages. Um, there was none of that in Madagascar, right. uh, that side of it. Um, what there was that was the same is the centralization of financial control by the state at the hands of the president in order to create state-led industry. Right. That part was the same. Um, and uh, as Nyerere, but that's also what was so close to um, pre pre reform Soviet style socialism, right? Um, uh, and uh, so, so it was much, yeah, I would say it was much closer to that Soviet style. There was mm -hmm. no Politburo or the equivalent of a Politburo mm -hmm. uh, uh, in structure. And it was, unlike the Soviet Union, it was. You know, it was very strongly wrapped around development, which is again the scientific socialism part. But it, but it was a command economy as opposed to uh, collective farming or things like that that made it that made it socialist. All right. And how did the then the IMF reforms starting at you know still under the presidency? Um, what kind of changes did they make, or did they ask for specifically to the economy? Beyond, the, I guess, the typically the typical IMF agenda of privatization, uh, liberalization of trade. How did they view the problems of the economy under uh, the Red Admiral and under his socialist program? And what were the impacts of that for Madagascar in the long run? Yeah, good question. And let me separate the IMF from the World Bank in this case. Okay. I'll address both of them. Um, so the IMF's role is. They see themselves as apolitical, right? Mm -hmm. So, so from the IMF perspective, it didn't matter if he called himself a socialist, if there were elections, or like none of that mattered. What right. did matter was he pegged the Malgash Frank, um, yeah. and and I, and and that makes the economy tank, right? right. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, so, so, so he had to release the peg. They did allow for for most of the eighties. They allowed for a floating peg. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that was sort of a, I don't know, a compromise of sorts, I guess, right? Um, but it was it was pegged. Um, oh, I should be sure of this. I think it was fifty. It was to the U.S. dollar, actually. So I, I think it was fifty Malgash francs to the U.S. dollar. Um, I think was the peg. But but as you know, as those white elephants died, right? And and as the economy went down, then. Um, uh, then those terms of trade, like it didn't, it didn't allow for the inflationary pressures or for the reduction in the value of the uh, of the franc, and that's what the IMF had to do. So that uh, uh, had to enforce. So what that meant was a very, it, it was a managed change, but in a short period of time, um, and that change uh, in the value of the franc malgache meant that uh, it was 
painful for the population um, mm -hmm. and it destroyed the development agenda uh, because there was no you know, there were very there was almost zero foreign holdings after that right so 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 with so I'm sorry foreign currency holdings right so so if you if you've close to zero foreign currency holdings and your and your currency is sliding then you're not paying for anything right <laughs> and so it meant on the one hand um you know the the upper class or the, the wealthier could not buy their luxury goods very easily um except for the very top which would just fly to france um but uh, uh but but locally you couldn't buy goods um in that way and and perhaps more importantly he couldn't fund his development agenda so while it was not the imf's goal to say you can't have state-led growth or something like that it was effectively what happened um, mm. by making those kinds of reforms to the economy and there were also there were it wasn't just you know, monetary policy. There, there were a lot of fiscal policy areas they insisted upon, um, uh, as well in spending areas and uh, banking control laws, things like that. Right, that um, that if you're going to do business with the IMF, you have to do right. And and so that brought Madagascar much more in line with international norms, but it came at a great deal of financial pain to the population, uh, and. Uh, and took away the tool that Sirak had to call himself this this state-led growth development president, right? Mm -hmm. the world, that's where the World Bank then enters. And you know, if, I, I don't know how well you know the the World Bank's history of how it's you know given aid, but but that was right at the beginning of of structural adjustment, um, you know, nineteen eighty one. Oh, I should know this for sure. I think it was eighty-one. The the Berg report um, that led to structural adjustment, um, and uh, and it was, it was right at the beginning where we started to see structural adjustment in its early form of structural adjustment take seed. And Madagascar was an early adopter of structural adjustment reforms. Mm -hmm. uh, what that meant was um, liberalization of different sectors of healthcare, education. You know, it placed sectors that you otherwise even even in uh, Democratic socialist countries in Europe might be state led. <laughs> Even in, un, under those reforms, you couldn't do that, right? So we see, so we see a, a significant reduction of the state role, not because it was a change in philosophy from the president, but because if you're going to engage with the World Bank and take that money, then it's part of structural adjustment, which works in those you know sector by sector uh, to do that. Um, so, so is that, those were the significant changes in the 1980s. So, so by 1989, when we saw the the final sort of last breath of of socialism, that it really was a last breath because again we saw the impacts across particular sectors such as health, education, water, you know, um, already from from the World Bank, and we already saw many of the mon the monetary policy reforms and the and the fiscal reforms again in banking and things like that because of the IMF. Um, right. and so, so yeah, we saw that as as part of the tumult of the 1980s. Right. And just just to pick up on the the just a little further back, the Malagash Frank. Um, I, how does it relate to the in this in the period I guess in the 90s, but also very much leading up to that? So I understand that the Frank was. Uh, disconnected from the uh the franc itself the french franc um a little bit prior to when it was dropped from being the currency of madagascar but how does it relate to the cfa franc uh or i guess the devaluation of the franc uh in the 1990s in joining the euro and how that helps in like phasing this out from the economy of Ma uh, of madagascar and i guess also too i i think madagascar seems as a similar, I guess, to Guinea and Mali as two or three examples of countries that didn't continue with the franc after independence. So can you explain more about how that policy came about, how they kind of fared on their own with their own semi-independent currency that still seemed yeah. attached to the franc in some way, and then how in the 90s it was affected by uh, France joining the euro, the overall devaluation that similarly affected the continental France Afrique, um, stuff like that. Yeah, so there wasn't, um, 
there wasn't pressure to adopt the CFR or something like the the central franc, right? um, central Africa, uh, because because it wasn't in West Africa, right? right. Uh, uh, so so there was there's a geographic difference, but during the first republic with that first president, um, mm -hmm. the tie between the Malgache franc and the French franc was uh, was strong, it, very similar and moved together in the way that the, in a very similar way to the CFI and the, and the French franc, right? Um, during that, but that, but the difference is, is that unlike um, you know, Mali, for instance, which has had multiple uh, military periods um, uh, in in Madagascar, that you know, again, what's viewed as locally as a as a revolution of 1972, uh, did away with that tie, right, um, between the French franc and uh, or and the uh, Malgache franc. So, so I mentioned about the idea of. Um, not allowing the float right mm. during the socialist period. The, however, when we fast forward to the period of moving from the French franc to the euro, at that point, it really didn't matter because by 1993, we saw the full float of the Franc Malgache. It was also at that time that, uh, that we started to see a change in the language that was a long, slow transition between the the Malgash franc and the Ariar, which is what's used now, um, it, which is really just nomenclature, right? Because because the the Ariar is one fifth uh, of the value of the Malgash franc, so because it's a tied value to the Malgash franc, um, it's not actually it's not like the the Ariar is afloat and the franc Malgash is not or something like that, right? Um, yeah. Uh, it's more like a, a tool by which presidents could uh, mask the political pain of a devaluing currency. Yeah. Uh, I'd compare that more to uh, in the early 80s when when Israel went from the shekel to the new Israeli shekel mm -hmm. by just removing three zeros, right? <laughs> because right because they had hyperinflation and then got it under control and said, but oh, we don't want to have to carry around 10,000 uh, or whatever, right? Um, shekel bills. Um, so, um, so let's uh, so let's instead call it the new Israeli shekel and, and cut off three zeros, right? It's right. a similar sort of thinking with the Ariad. Um, but by that point, it was floating. So uh, against a basket of currencies uh, in the '90s. So the move to the euro was not was not any more important than other countries that float, right? So um, the whole world had to adjust to the rise of the euro, of course. Um, but but it wasn't painful in the way that you had to sever from the French franc or something like that by that yeah. point. Yeah, which was a, a lot more traumatic for West African nations that had to go Absolutely, through. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, it, and, and anyone under the CFA, right, it was really, that was rough, right? So. Right. Well, I'm curious just in, I guess, in, in kind of a concluding note about the legacy of the socialist revolution in Madagascar, um, are there still political parties today or movements today that that call on the rhetorical or political legacy of the Red Admiral or represent kind of a socialist uh, opposition to the current uh, political system or establishment within Madagascar? Or for the most part, are people like that, is, you know, bygones or bygones, we don't really want to go back to that period? Um. I'll take door number three, actually. <laughs> that, um, um, that, so, so first, um, it's really interesting what happened with Razia personally from the time he was ousted from office until the time he died a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so he lived in France most of that time and eventually came back to Madagascar. And in coming back to Madagascar not long before he died, um, he came back a hero. Right. And, and viewed and not not for really socialism, but more like as a founding father is viewed kind of right, right. Like, and mm -hmm. as this important figure, and he still has a lasting influence, um, uh, not because of the socialism, but because uh, because of the figure that he was, and because uh, and, and because he of uh, specifically because he was because he's from Betsimesirica that he was from the east coast. And okay. this sort of central versus coastal 
uh, political divide is very important. Uh, and he was the, he's also the last leader from the coast um, in, in that, that when, when Marco Lamanana took power in 2002, it was unheard of because he was from the capital region in the center of the country and, and was ethnically Madonna. Mm -hmm. And until that point, it was sort of a, I don't know, like a soft agreement, let's say, that, that if you're Madonna, you don't become president because mm -hmm. you control so much of the economy and it's too much power to concentrate in one ethnic group. So you right. have those, that privileged ethnic group controls the economy and the coast, one of the coastal um, ethnicities controls the, the politics. Uh -huh. And so when Ravel Manana came in, that meant someone who is Manana controlled both, right? right. Um, and so, so then after, after him, we've had this, you know, sequence of uh, one, so, so, you know, uh, uh, first Rosalina and the transition, then Rosalina um, uh, was elected and now Rosalina is back in. They're all from the capital region, right? Oh. And, uh, and so those from the coastal regions are saying, Rasirak was our last person from the coast, right? And so there's that importance to his role. And he's sort of seen in that way as having that influence, but not because of socialism. Right. On the socialism side, there, there is a socialist party, but it has no, no seats in, uh, in the legislature and it doesn't have any power. And if there's any impact, it's that it destroyed the sort of broader philosophical notions of socialism. Um, right. And there is, you know, there's, there's, you know, looking today, there's uh, Andrew Oswald as president, and there is no organ, like the opposition is just destroyed right now, right? Like there, there's no, like going into the new election, as we start thinking about new elections, there's, there's no one, I mean, really. But you can look at the different political parties and no one that's even imaginable on the horizon has any socialist tendencies. No civil, civil associations or civil society groups or like are espousing socialist norms, nobody, right? Yeah. And I think it's, if anything, the impact is, Socialism is associated with the Second Republic, and we don't want that, right? Okay. And uh, and perhaps even more interesting, it's not just that we don't want that. It's there's not a potential leader out there that is looking to disengage from the global economy, from right. European relationships, from international trade, right? Like that 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 there's different views of the world, and there's different uh, certainly different uh, political and power interests. But on that, they agree. Right. Very capitalist, yeah. <laughs> right. So the the horizons are very limited, and I guess I just just two final follow up questions on that note. And the first is maybe a little more complicated, but in just in concluding, what is the role of of France still in Madagascar? Yeah, another good question. And uh, so so France plays an important role in a couple of ways. One is in trade, obviously. Um, the other is in this sort of almost specter of a domestic political actor. Uh, mm -hmm. And what I mean by that was, so, so Marc Rablamanana was, so first of all, his, he, his French is awful. Um, okay. And he speaks English better than French, okay. which is highly unusual in Madagascar. Right. And, and, and when he was president in the 2000s, uh, in 2007 specifically, there was a constitutional change to make Madagascar a three language country with okay. English, French and Malgash. Um, and the idea was sort of along the line of Rwanda, which moved away from French entirely, right? right? And that's what Ravala Manana wanted to do. Um, and this was the first step, but he was, you know, thrown out of office, um, <laughs> removed from him. And, uh, um, and, uh, and so that lasted from, 2000, the 2007 constitutional reforms to the new constitution of 2010. So there was never the opportunity for English to come in in that way. Um, and and it's, and uh, and Rajwana's ties to France are extremely strong. Mm -hmm. And uh, he grew up truly with French as a, you know, two first languages as French right. and Malgache's first languages. Um, he, he was educated in France. Um, he, uh, yeah, he has very strong French ties, and it's very important to him in that way. And and to add one more factor that there's this 
dating back to the early 1800s, this uh, positioning for influence between Britain and France okay. that led to the rise of product Protestant reforms and Catholic reforms. Okay. And the country is almost evenly divided between Pro Protestantism and Catholicism. And Rav Lamana is Protestant and Rav Lamana is Catholic. And so for these reasons, Catholicism is tied to France and Protestantism to England um, or to English, right? And so that France part has this sort of cultural piece as well, right? Mm -hmm. So today it does come out as a bit of a, a domestic specter, as I said, in a way that's tied to, to in, way, in ways that's not France itself, and they're not decisions France is making today, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's about how it's being utilized within the domestic political space. In a practical sense, though, as well as ties, close ties to France has meant um, the moves that, that Rav Lamanen has started to take to diversify trade, for instance, has significantly shrunk and the reliance upon France for trade has increased once again. Uh, and so there is a very close trade relationship. The ties in some political ways are very not good right now um, for a list of reasons I go into, but, but um, some of the political ties are not fantastic, but they are seen as just sort of political things as opposed to, I think France and Madagascar right now are happy that they're close again and in, in sort of in those, in those ties. Right. Last thing I'll mention is, is uh, in Madagascar, there's often confusion between activities that are private sector by French people mm -hmm. activities versus French government okay. activities, right? And that's often confused, right? So um, starting with the funding of the overthrow of Mark Ravla in 2009, it's broadly believed to have external funds that paid for it. Um, and the accusation is that it was the French government. And that seems very, very far-fetched, right? Uh -huh. However, there's some pretty good evidence pointing to some specific private sector French individuals, right? <laughs> um, yeah. um, that can fund, right? And they had, for them, it's about business interests, right? Um, but again, for the average Malgash person, they just know someone French speaking, right? Um, right. And so, so again, it goes to that's not the government of France's fault, and it doesn't have to do with those direct ties, but it does have to do with this sort of embedded cultural domestic relationship that goes on. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Fascinating to see how there's a, in many, I think, uh, Rwanda, I think the good example you pointed to of this continued kind of uh, I, I don't know what you would say, like divide and conquer kind of between like the long lasting English and French uh, traditions and, and the specter, like you said. My very last question, because I, I don't want to hold you for any longer, but it's just kind of a simple um, biographical note, but why was he called the, the Red Admiral? Was he part, he, from what I'm reading, he was part of the French Naval Academy. Did he, when he was in power, um, emphasize the Navy in particular in Madagascar or or how did that kind of um, mythology come to be associated with him? Because I, I also read just from reading a little bit of background on him that he was nicknamed Deva as well. So like a big man as well. So kind of, I guess, what was this like mythos that he created when, when he was in power? So the, the Red Admiral, I think, was given to him and okay. he embraced it, but <laughs> given to him. Um, but, um, but I... But I think it's as superficial as it sounds. That is, so he was actually not, he was made an admiral by the directorate in order to become president. He was not okay. already an admiral, right? Okay. Um, but you, you can't have a flight lieutenant, I think was his title or something like that, right? As a, um, as a president, right? Uh, well, I guess you can, right? As, as we saw that okay. elsewhere, right? But <laughs> in Ghana or whatever, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but but in this case, they wanted him to be admiral in order to be president. So they promoted him in order to be president. Um, so he he had the rank of admiral, uh, and so that was a given rank. The red okay. part came from the came from the socialism, mm -hmm. right? Um, and specifically having a you know a Bukim, uh, you know in Malgash it's Bukimena and people which is which is the Malgash for red book, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and people refer to it as the Bukimena um, and. And so it's, and Mena is, uh, it's actually worth mentioning. Mena is, I mean, it's the, 
it's, it, it's the A word for red, um, but it's not the only word for red. And it's in a very specific context that okay. is culturally bound. Of, um, it's, about, it's used for like red cloth and the like. And, um, and it's what's used, um, uh, if you've heard about the turning of the dead in Madagascar. And, yeah, um, I have heard um, about that. that you, um, it, it's, a, it's an honor that stems from the feudal period that when you wrap someone in something red, right? Okay. Um, and it's a, it's a spiritual honor connecting you to the ancestors, right? So, so by calling it the Bukimena, it has this like much bigger sort of connotation even, right? That fits really nicely. And I think in calling him the Red Admiral, I don't think it's, I don't think it's so specifically culturally embedded in the way that I'm saying it, but it had, but when you, when you say the word, it invokes this bigger, this bigger thing about being engulfed in that red, you know? Um, and so I think there's that, that further point, even if, again, I think the actual naming part is he wrote a red book, and he was an admiral, let's call him this, right? right. Um, and, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, uh, and the other names he was called, it's, that's very common in Madagascar to have a series of uh, uh, nicknames, I guess you'd say, right? That are for different things. Um, so, uh, I have a, um, yeah, just friends gave me a, a Malgash name at some point, and I was so honored by that, right? But it uh -huh. kind of like, as I learned over time though, it's like, yeah, but you didn't give me a nickname though, you gave me a name, right? That's not quite the honor, like I'd be much more honored to be given like a nickname, right? <laughs> and, uh, and especially people in higher power um, get get these nicknames of different sorts. That's, that's a pretty common practice. Right. Well, the the part about the the turning over of the dead being associated with with the red book, and I guess with him by proxy, that's really fascinating to see this kind of like spiritual connection with um, with his vision of of socialism. So I think that's really that's really interesting. Um, and I do want to emphasize he never used that, and so I don't want to attribute it to him, but rather but, just say when you say Bukimena, like you you get that feeling from it. I don't think that, like I've never seen anything that says he's associated things in that way or, you know, um, but, but I'm making that point that when you say that in Melgash, it has that kind of sentiment. Okay. That's fascinating. Um, well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to My pleasure. teach me more about uh, the Madagascar revolution um, and the Red Admiral. So. Uh, I, I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, reading more about it independently. I, I've been reading about Franz Afrik for the journal that we're writing here, um, and just learning more. I think we've been focusing on West Africa because of what's happening in Mali, but now kind of seeing also the impact in Madagascar as well to always remember, okay, that was also part of, of Franz Afrik, even if it was disconnected, um, was very fascinating. And, and also to see the socialist program as this like developmentalist program, um, which I think, as you mentioned, comes up a lot um, in, in Africa and in the global South in general, was really fascinating. So thank you so much. My pleasure. And if I can just, as you said that, if I can make the recommendation for some, some reading, I, you might want to contrast just uh, looking at, at Mauritanian history from Chadian history on that, um, as Chad is, you know, until last year had 30 years of, you know, the same leader in place right. uh, and what that meant for someone that uh, ultimately became a really good, auto, like really successful autocrat that could last 30 years that way and dies in the battlefield, literally in, right. in un, like, it seems so unimaginable in 2021 that that could happen, right? Right, uh, study. Uh, right exactly. And in contrast to Mauritania, where France was overlaid on top of this very complex uh, social structure that's still in place from um, from the from the period of Arab domination, right? And uh, the ways in which France is superimposed on top of sort of those layers of uh, the the Arab period, and, and then on top of of uh, what are semi nomadic and nomadic cultures, right? Like this, the layers of that are so different. And I think it serves a really nice contrast if you're looking for trying to understand that France Afrique. And if you're yeah. France, how do you deal with Mauritania on the one hand and Chad on the other right? uh, when you have those kinds of dynamics? Anyway, just a, just a 
two cents. <laughs> well, that sounds very interesting. I'm, I'm definitely going to look up and read some more of that. And, and when we write a, our, our article, our journal, we're doing on a semester basis. So we'll have it done at the end of the semester. I'll definitely send by the, the, uh, the article on, on Friends of Freak and you can, can check it out. I look forward to it. Well, good luck with your writing. Thank uh, you. uh, and it's a, always fun to talk about Madagascar. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.